Hello, welcome to Chris's Ticks. Today we're going to be doing a deep dive on vintage Timex mechanical watch movements. Specifically, today we're going to be looking at the M24 movement. However, what I'm going to say is going to broadly apply to most mechanical Timex watches. Uh, this includes a lot of the automatic watches that you see floating around, as well as the Mercury series watches, Marlin watches. I would think everything other than the Timex 21 and 400 series uh, mechanicals, this basically applies. And to a lighter extent, some of this will also apply to the uh, 21 series. Now, we'll first get started by talking about this through the lens of vintage watch ads. And then we'll transition over to everyone's favorite medium, macro video with voiceover. Well, let's get started. All right, so this is an ad for Caravelle watches. And it reads, ask your jeweler, which $10.95 watch he'd buy. So in this next Caravelle ad, it actually goes over why Caravelle watches are a good choice. It doesn't explicitly say Timex, but it kind of implies it pretty heavily. The ad reads, you've got to have guts to make a good watch for $10.95. To make a good watch for that money, you've got to put good insides into it. So we put quality watch parts into the Bulova Caravelle. Like a precision jeweled movement instead of an inexpensive pen lever one that doesn't last as long. And a big balance wheel instead of a small one that won't keep as good time. And gears with finely machined teeth instead of stamped out gears that won't mesh well. But it takes guts of another kind to make a watch this way. Because putting more expensive parts into a Caravelle and selling it for a low price means we don't make much on it. So we have to rely on a lot of people buying it, and that doesn't shake us. We don't need guts to buy a good watch for $10.95. For the next ad, we're going to look at a Timex ad. Specifically, we're just going to look at the V-Conic movement description. Only Timex watches have the revolutionary V-Conic movement, the greatest advance in over 200 years of watchmaking. The unique cone-shaped balance staff turns on enduring Arma alloy bearings. The Iconic movement is strong where conventional watches are generally weakest. So now that we've seen the ad, let's dive into the actual movements. What we've got here today is the uh, Timex movement with the V Conic and the uh, Caraval 11 DP that we've seen in the ads that Caraval ran. And let's have a look at them both. Let's get started. So let's talk about the uh, first ad there that I mentioned, uh, ask which watch your jeweler would buy. And it implied that they'd probably buy the Caravelle if they had the choice. And that's actually probably true. Now, the second ad that we looked at goes over some reasons for this. But I think that there, there are much bigger reasons to be had to select the Caravelle over the Timex. Now, if, looking at the movement side by side for a uh, watchmaker, one of the things that would probably pop first is that the Caravelle is built like a traditional watch, something that they're familiar with. But notably, like most traditional watches, you have uh, different bridges splitting up the watch kind of based on function. That, and that really makes the serviceability a lot higher. Whereas on the Timex, you can see that there's only really one large bridge, meaning that in order to uh, basically rebuild the watch, you have to have all the pivots aligned at once to kind of get this to go on top and fit nicely. Whereas on the uh, Caravelle, you kind of put it together uh, in a piecemeal fashion. It's it's not actually super hard, and it's actually pretty relaxing. Where I've done the Timex before, it is atrociously unfun. And to be honest, on more than one occasion, I just stopped trying. I ended up just putting in a different Timex movement that I had. That was essentially the same thing. All right, so now that we've established the Caravelle is in general a superior watch technically, we're gonna put the watch away and we're gonna focus on the Timex and look at it from another perspective. Uh, where the Timex really shines is manufacturability and cost cutting to a degree that is kind of crazy. And we'll go over this and I'll essentially show you everything that I think that 
went into the watch that makes it just kind of a marvel of mass production. All right, so like I said, the Timex is essentially a pillar plate construction where everything sits on or in between those two plates. All right, so let's have a look at one of these plates. Uh, by and large, you can see that there aren't a lot of machining moves on, on the plates. Uh, really, you got a couple punches and a couple drilling operations to uh, make a place for the pivots to sit. I'm gonna assume that the uh, where the pivot holes are, they're also probably polished to reduce friction. Uh, and that's it on these things. Uh, again, cost reduction here. The less moves you gotta do, the cheaper it's gonna be to make. All right, so if we flip this watch over and you can see the dial side of the movement now, you'll notice some of the stuff that the uh, second Caravelle ad brought up in that you can see more clearly the stamped gears. And if you have a close look at them, you can see that it is a fairly rough looking gear compared to say the other gear on the Caravelle. Uh, other weird things to note is that a lot of the stuff on the, on the Timex it kind of it's kind of backwards or reversed on the Caravelle. You can see that the main spring screw, winding screw, is on the uh, back side of the watch, and on the Timex, it's on the dial side. So that's one of the other weird things about these Timex movements. A lot of stuff is some for some reason set on the the dial side of the watch, making again servicing really annoying. Uh, that being said, one plus you can kind of see here is a giant setting lever. Uh, this thing's probably never gonna break. So that's, that's a pro for the, probably the only pro on the uh, mechanical construction side that we're going to see on this plate. All right, so let's focus on the entire star of the show, the V-conic movement, specifically the balance. This is where all of Timex mar marketing really went into full high gear. And all it really was, was the refusal to use jeweled bearings because that costs extra money. And instead, they used a either Arma alloy plating or an Arma alloy screw, uh, and that's the little yellowing part that we see on that movement. Uh, what that really means is that that is a hardened bearing surface, so that would, in theory, reduce friction, and the conical shape of the staff, uh, I assume it would mean that the surface area that's exposed to friction is also reduced. And combined all this stuff together apparently exhibits high shock resistance. Uh, my guess would be that due to the increased hardness of the bearings compared to the balance staff uh, in the event of an impact, the bearing itself will not deform. However, the staff may wiggle a bit. and. Again, due to the V nature of the entire assembly, uh, for whatever amount that it moved, it'll probably just deform right back and continue operating in the center or center-ish of the bearing. And so I think that's really the entirety of the V-conic thing that they're kind of pitching there. And for the most part, the whole system worked. I mean, you see examples of these Timexes now that still run after 70 years. Uh, don't know what the service history is, but I'm gonna guess based on the price of the watch, not very, uh, not very regular service. All right, uh, now let's move on to the dial. So this is an area that is another place where Timex basically saves some pennies uh, in basically every other watch. The dial is usually affixed via dial legs and a set of screws, uh, but not on a Timex, no. Uh, looking at the watch dial we have here, you can see that the watch dial has no feet. At least not ones that you're normally looking for. It does, however, have these tiny little tabs on the edge of the watch dial. And what this basically is, is that you put the dial on top where you need it to sit and then you fold the tabs down and that's what holds your dial in. Uh, this is an area which I actually think probably was a bit of a mistake. They, they should have sprang a little more money and actually made the dial a little more robust. Uh, again, considering that the movement itself was incredibly robust, I'm surprised that they went this way with the dial. 
Uh, maybe they assumed that the, the watch would never ever be serviced and therefore it did not really need to have the watch dial ever be taken out. Uh, however, it has proven to be one of the weird Achilles heels of this kind of watch. And that's because basically when you take the watch dial off, every time that dial comes off, every time you flex that piece of metal, the little tab, you're running the risk of snapping the tab. It's the same as if you were going to take a paper clip and you're just going to fold it back and forth in on itself. You get a couple in, but eventually the, uh, the metal snaps. Now, I mentioned that maybe they didn't think that the uh, service was ever going to be done on it, but I have actually looked at the uh, Timex service manual for their, at least their 21 joule version of the exact same movement. And it does go over how to do a service. And to do that, it is actually required that you do remove the dial. Uh, so maybe they just assume that over the life of the watch, it would maybe get one service, something that the dial would probably survive. However, that's still pretty annoying and a bit disappointing to see. But save a penny, earn a penny, as one of my friends said. It's the mentality of this watch, so it's not surprising. It just sucks. All right, so the last thing I want to talk about is the stem and crown. Uh, you'll notice that it looks pretty close to a normal stem and crown combo. It's maybe a little bit thicker, uh, a little more coarse looking. Uh, however, there's one thing missing from a stem and crown on a Timex, and that is the threads. You'll notice that on the uh, stem and crown on most Timex mechanicals from this era, uh, automatic, manual, uh, doesn't matter, they're broadly the same. There are no threads. And what this means is that the stem and crown are essentially a pressure fit piece together. So if you remove a stem from a crown, chances are if you push that thing back together, it's not going to function as well as it did before, just because now the friction on the crown is probably less than what it was prior. You could probably grab a set of pliers and squeeze that back down. But honestly, uh, once it happened to me, I kind of just chucked it and kind of got frustrated. Uh, I know it's a really small thing, but I've worked on a lot of these Timexes and there have been a couple times where uh, repair has been delayed due to a uh, stem or crown being broken and I just didn't have a suitable combo of stem or crown to fit. Whereas if I had done this on a regular mechanical watch, I probably would have had a spare stem ready and a crown and I could have just cut the stem to the lengths I needed and then applied the stem and crown combo to have a fully functioning watch. Whereas on the Timex, uh, there seemed to be a nearly infinite combination of like stem length, uh, which is kind of funny because the rest of the uh, actual stem that, that engages the movement is identical for essentially every Timex from the M24 up to the last think in-house one was like the 105 whichever one it is whichever mechanical or automatic it is the the shape of the uh, engagement the engaging side of the stem has been essentially unchanged for at least 60 years the thing that does change is the random lengths that kind of tie the uh, either a series or a particular watch to that stem and crown and I don't know I found it really annoying and yeah, just wanted to rant about that.